It's a great pleasure to welcome Ambassador Neil Fahmy to uh, the Harvard Kennedy School, back to the Kennedy School, I should say. Ambassador Fahmy was a longtime Egyptian diplomat, ambassador to Japan uh, for nine years, Egypt's ambassador to the United States, now the founding dean of the School of Public Policy at the American University in Cairo. Ambassador Fahmy, thank you for being a uh, fellow in our diplomacy project. And I wanted to ask you about this very dramatic revolution that's taken place in Egypt since January. You're now 10 months into that revolution. Is it a true revolution, political, social, economic? Do you anticipate that eventually Egypt will, will be a completely transformed country and society because of the events in Tahrir Square last January? First, let me say I, it's great to be back. It, it really is always a pleasure to come here, and it, it's an uh, experience just to listen and engage with the faculty and the students. So, Nick, thank you for the invitation. Pleasure. In terms of what's happening in Egypt, I think it's actually larger than what people think. This is a changing relationship between the powerful and the, and the less powerful, be that rich and poor, govern governing. Uh, it's a social uh, transition. That affects how you govern politically. It will affect how the economy works. It will affect almost day-to-day -day life. Now, so for me, it is a revolution. Whether it is a successful one or not, I actually think that will also, we are assured, a successful result. How quickly that will happen depends on how we put together a political system, how soon we put together a political system, where it is accountable, transparent, and also competitive, and where everybody has equal rights. And that's going to be a challenge because it means changing processes and stakeholders and practices that have gone for 60 years, even before the President Mubarak. So this is, we have not had a democratic system uh, since the 52 revolution, actually exactly since 1954. But with the beginning of the 52 revolution, we moved more and more into one party state and then into a centralized system, then slowly opening up politically. But it was not a, a transparent, accountable, or competitive system for the last 60 years. So you have to change a lot of practices and procedures, not only personnel. Right. And um, now you enter this very difficult period, but it's also an optimistic period right. when you're going to have elections. You'll have a parliament formed. You'll have a constitution written. You'll have a president elected. And the big issue of, of whether the military will agree to step back from power, whether those, some of those running for office say the Muslim Brotherhood will agree to share power should they gain uh, power. Um, I know it's, a, it's difficult to look into a crystal ball and to predict exactly what's going to happen, but are you reasonably confident that Egypt's moving in the right direction and that it's more likely than less that Egypt will become democratic? I, five months ago, I was more confident than I am now. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit anxious mm -hmm. because we've made too many mistakes. It's, it's taking, the process should have been constitution first, then elections for president, and then parliament. That being said, you don't always get everything you want in life, and particularly in politics. Uh, we're, we've moved on the road. Uh, there will be a higher price, but we will get there. Uh, we will learn from our mistakes. Uh, I don't believe the military wants to govern in the future. They probably, given that they were part of the 52 re revolution uh, regime, uh, want to preserve as many of their traditional rights and, and fringe benefits as, as they can. But just the fact that we're debating this with them, and they're debating it with us, is a reflection of how serious the revolution has actually occurred. You wouldn't have had this debate 10 months ago. Um, the same applies to the Muslim Brotherhood. They're now above board. It's not a, a, uh, uh, an illegal organization any longer. They will have to prove that their policies uh, truly respond to the aspirations of the people. When I say the people, I mean all the people, not only the Muslim Brotherhood supporters. Um, I actually believe that Egypt is a cosmopolitan society, that the majority of Egyptians are, are inclusive in, in the sense that they accept the others, so to speak. Uh, the challenge is to get them out to participate in the voting process and in the political process, because in the past they've been absent. Right. Um, when you do have a new government, 
you're going to have a, a challenge of deciding whether Egyptian foreign policy should continue as it's been over the last several decades or whether there'll be strategic as well as tactical changes. I think from my perspective, we've already seen changes in Egyptian foreign policy, a new independence, a stronger voice, I think, if I can say that, of Egypt in the region and in the world. This is your domain. You've been a long time Egyptian diplomat. Uh, take us through this question. What, what kind of country will Egypt be as it relates to the rest of the world? Our foreign policy will be more progressive, more constructive, more forceful, and we will have to balance it, given that we will be a more open democratic system, between our strategic commitments and the political pressures caused by having an active democracy. Right. Uh, to be precise, we will do strategically what serves our interest best. How we do it will be defined by our domestic politics. And, and the example that I want to give is our relationship with the U.S. is of paramount importance and will be, irrespective of who's elected. Hmm. What we argue with the U.S. on and what we, mo what we cooperate with them on will be determined by short-term policies and short-term politics. But the overall objective for any Egyptian government will be to have a s strong, manageable relationship with the most important country and the most powerful country in the world. The same thing applies to regional conflicts, the Arab-Israeli conflict in particular. Comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace was Nasser's objective, Sadat's objective, Mubarak's objective, and now <coughs> it hasn't been challenged by any of the revolutionary movements. Uh, and I think that will be the G objective of the next Egyptian government, irrespective of whether it's an Islamist, secular, left-leaning, right-leaning government. On the other hand, I think, and uh, you, uh, you t really touched on the, the, uh, the issue quite directly, you will see a more forceful expression of our opinions, because the public wa holds the government accountable. If there are destruction of houses in East Jerusalem, the public will speak out, and the government will be... Uh, Palestinian homes. Palestinian homes, yeah. you know, Palestinian homes, of course. Yes. Uh, the, and the government will have to respond and explain why they took or didn't take a certain position, what they did to try to convince the Israelis. At the same time, while trying to continue to promote an Arab city peace, um, the same will apply to the issue of the water resources in the Nile water resources, our relations with the uh, uh, states on the Nile Basin. They've been neglected for so long, and the public is frankly quite angry that we haven't given more focus uh, on that. And how do you deal with that to make it a win-win situation where the Nile Basin countries feel that their development needs are met at the same time as our historic rights are respected? Um, and the time difference between a, a consistent historic right and the return on a, on a development need is something you have, you have to manage. And you can go on to even more delicate issues. As we become a stronger, more vibrant democracy, our people will expect us to stand up for the aspirations of people in the Middle East for more democracy. Now, and we will have to balance our real interest, short-term interest, with the nation-states in our region without promoting regime change, with the values that our people now have embraced of giving the people of the region freedoms and, and, and equal rights. So it's a delicate uh, situation. But I think overall we become stronger by foreigners, be they from the region or beyond the region, listening to the full voice and the resonance of, of the opinions of our people in, in, in Egypt, uh, that's a much stronger uh, resounding uh, um, voice than simply the opinion of, of the government or one party or the other. So there are two issues in particular, I think, where the United States has direct interest in the Middle East, will want to continue working with Egypt. One would be maintaining the Egyptian-Israeli peace agreement of 1979. And second, we'll be finding a way to block and contain Iranian power in the Middle East, particularly as Iran grows closer to a nuclear weapons capability. Do you see any chance that 
Egypt would not be able to cooperate with the U.S. on those two major issues? We started the Arab-Israeli peace, peace process initially with the 73 war and then ultimately with the peace process after that. Uh, we even supported the Oslo process before America did. So we are committed to peace because it serves our interest. That it also serves America's interest is even better. But we did this because of our own interest. And Egyptians will not move away from it unless it proves not to be in our interest. And that would really require a major catastrophe in the region for that to change. So I don't see any shift in the Arab-Israeli, uh, uh, our position vis-a-vis -vis peace with Israel. And I think when some assume we're doing it as a favor for America, they're not reading properly uh, our reasoning behind this. And therefore, it's not really an issue put to question, in my mind at least. In all my years in diplomacy, I never saw any instructions or received any instructions that inferred that we were doing this for somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's our national interest, mm -hmm. and, and so we will continue to do this. On the issue of Iran, uh, I was asked recently, having done some work on, on disarmament, whether I, why I didn't think that Iran nuclear program was actually good and served as leverage to balance the Israeli program, which is not part of the NPT. And I said I didn't support the Israeli program, I don't support the Iranian program. More people having nuclear weapons does not help solve the problem. Uh, now, I don't support using force against Iran in responding to their program. I don't think that's the solution to it, and I don't think it's an effective solution to, to it either. Developing a stronger consensus uh, from the region vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian program is the way to move on this. To do that, America cannot ignore the, the Israeli program. But you have a very sophisticated diplomatic uh, establishment, and I'm sure we can find ways where you don't make the Iranian program contingent on resolving the, the Israeli program, but you can handle both at the same time to respond to the balance in political needs domestically, uh, short term and long term. And that's a typical example of how dealing with public policy issues is much more complicated in democratic societies than it is in uh, centralized autocratic societies. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, just one final question. President Obama, in my judgment, was rather quick in transferring allegiance from President Mubarak to Tahrir Square. He supported the young people there. He transformed U.S. policy. A logical question now is, you know, what more can and should the United States do to support the ongoing process of reform in Egypt? What's the proper place for the United States? And what are some things we might want to avoid doing in order to respect the newfound freedom and I would say even sovereignty of the people sure. of Egypt? This, this has to be an Egyptian experience. Mm -hmm. Egyptian experiment, we will fail or succeed. Um, and in that sense, I found President Obama's positions quite reasonable and appropriate. Uh, he supported the values behind it, but uh, at the same time had to look at in terms of the process of change itself. Had he moved too quickly, it would have appeared that the U.S. is doing this, and it yeah. wasn't. Yeah. So I, even in terms of the appropriateness, I don't think it would have been appropriate for him to do that more, qu more quickly than that. Uh, what it can do for the future is different. I'd like to see our election process be about hope not about frustration and anger. Uh, we're going to go through a severe liquidity crunch in the next two months. Tourism is down. Uh, expat money is down. Foreign investment is down. Productivity is down. Uh, and demands on government resources are, are significantly up. So there's a, going to be a liquidity crunch. The economy over the medium and long term will be solid. All the tenants are there. But in the short term, we're going through a problem. Uh, frankly, what we need now as we go through the election process is for people to believe in their capacity to build the future, not in anger and frustration or in some larger force helping them resolve this. So I know you're going through a very difficult budgetary problem here, uh, as is the rest of the world. But there are situations where, especially global powers like the United States, have to look at the short-term and long-term benefits 
of their investments. And I would lead a, uh, uh, a much more concrete and precise international support program for Egypt. And, uh, frankly, the G8 and the G20 proposals on Egypt are so complicated, they need a PhD program to understand what exactly the money is. Thank you very much. Ambassador Fahmy, thank you for being with us again at Harvard. We hope to see you again here thank in the you, future. Nick. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you.